So I have this really daunting task of trying to summarize uh, what's been a very uh, intense and uh, uh, deep uh, day of discussion. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to do it justice by weaving in some of the key concepts uh, that, that were raised uh, um, into sort of a, a more holistic package. Um, and then for those of you who are new um, to our day here, uh, I see that there are a lot of new faces, um, which I, hadn't, I didn't realize that uh, uh, there were going to be a lot of people from outside of the investigator group uh, joining this session. But I hope that I'll give you enough of the uh, sort of foundational blocks um, that uh, uh, that, that sort of underlie um, the, the, the day-long discussion today um, so that we can bring you uh, onto the same page um, at the end of this talk. So um, as just at the outset, um, as, as Andrew uh, pointed out, um, I sort of sit at the space um, in between uh, research and in practice. Um, a lot of it has to do with my own sort of career evolution over the years, having worked um, in the federal government in the U.S. Um, and uh, also uh, in, in an academic setting. Um, and so much of what I think about uh, uh, is really how to create uh, changes not only at a sort of study level um, but at a more macro level in terms of how we do business, how we engage in partnerships, how do we develop uh, funding mechanisms um, that will support uh, systems changes, um, and are we asking the right kinds of questions even. Um, and, uh, and, and amongst the projects that are funded, you know, what, what is the coherence um, across uh, those uh, research initiatives. So that's kind of uh, the space from which I come and uh, how this, uh, hopefully this uh, presentation will unfold. So um, a quick outline of how I'm going to structure my presentation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll fly through very quickly the few slides I have on what is complexity, because I do think that it's, uh, especially for those who haven't been part of the day-long discussion, it's important for us to really define what we mean by systems and systems thinking a little bit. I'll then move on to what I think we can potentially do and give you some examples, uh, of some frameworks and some e examples attached to those frameworks um, that might uh, uh, inspire some new thinking around uh, novel strategies uh, that we can incorporate into our prevention efforts. And uh, finally, uh, I will uh, talk a little bit about how we might uh, uh, measure change, um, how do we assess uh, systems change, um, and, uh, um, and then I'll conclude with some final, so final thoughts. So, um, so what do we mean by complexity? So I think one of the challenges in the field is that we often talk about uh, the word system in a lot of different contexts, right? So we, we think about like the health system, you know, so we use the word system to describe sort of um, an entity, you know, of multiple layers and multiple organizations. Um, but then we also talk about like system science. And, um, but, and, and, and when we use the word system science, we're using that in a much more qualitative way. Um, we're saying that there's something unique um, in terms of the characteristics um, about these systems, whether it's a health system or a prevention system uh, or an educational system, that we need to specifically understand and potentially sp uh, explicitly intervene on in order to create systems changes. Okay, so put that on your radar screen because I'll come back to it throughout the talk and then at the end. Um, and the notion here is this is not just about uh, uh, addressing, you know, all the different levels in a socio-ecological uh, socio framework. Okay, so it's not just thinking about social determinants of health. Um, you can actually apply systems thinking at a cellular level um, as you can apply uh, systems thinking at a policy level. Um, and in between those levels. So with that said, um, one of the things that uh, is really characteristic of complex systems um, can be summarized by these two pictures. So here, here um, you have a picture of the forest, right? And then you also have a more granular view um, of one particular aspect of the forest. So um, a lot of what we do is sort of down here uh, in a much more reductionist way. 
Um, the, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually you know, very important work. But the challenge of focusing only um, at this granular, granular level is that we lose sight of some of the larger patterns that may be occurring um, when you take a bird's eye, view, bird's eye view of the whole forest. There could be a fire, for example, happening somewhere that you would be completely missing out on um, if uh, you didn't actually telescope back and forth between the granular view um, and the uh, bird's eye view. So that's actually what is meant um, by system scientists as emergence. Um, it's really the study of this relationship between the big picture um, in the details. And that's actually really important because the implication for the center is that, well, um, it, you know, there are a lot of skeptics and a lot of uh, people who might be hesitant about uh, embracing a systems approach to the center's mission. Um, and because they're focused on whichever project, you know, that they're working on. Um, but that may be okay, you know, if they've set that as sort of their boundary. But at the same time, it's just as important that we collectively understand how that project relates to the bigger cause, the bigger goals um, of the center. How do these different discrete projects actually uh, connect with each other in service of a new prevention paradigm um, that we're trying to move towards? So both the big picture and the details are important in this case, um, but how they're important is really the question. Um, and so which details are important for the big picture and how do behaviors of the big picture arise from properties of the details? And the key there is that the patterns um, that you observe at the higher level, they're not just the consequence of adding up all the little parts, right? So the ultimate success of the center isn't just adding up the however many 30, 40 projects, you know, prescribing the work plan, but it's actually going to be those uh, uh, projects adding up, being added up, as well as the interaction that may be arising, that may be happening as a result um, of the center's efforts. And those interactions, <laughs> as it turns out, um, in real life, um, contribute significantly to the larger uh, patterns and behaviors of complex systems, uh, in fact, of society. So um, another really important characteristic is the notion of interdependence, notion of feedbacks. And so, um, so just you know, as a caveat, I do work in the obesity space, so some of my examples may be a little obesity-centric, um, but I recognize that uh, the center does work uh, in a broad uh, range of chronic disease areas. Um, so here is a, a, a systems map, if you will, that was um, published uh, by uh, the UK Foresight Group, you know, way back in 2007. It was really seminal at the time um, because uh, for the first time, somebody actually um, underwent this really painstaking process to figure out like all the different components that contribute to the obesity system and what the interconnections are. But the point being here, um, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the traditional sort of linear way of thinking about causes and consequences clearly doesn't uh, quite capture what's going on um, in the case of obesity. And so uh, new ways um, of making, uh, uh, making it possible to capture these feedbacks uh, became really important. Um, and that was actually at the uh, sort of around the same time uh, when I myself, uh, you know, stepped into sort of a system science shoes uh, from a more traditional socio-ecological uh, framework of thinking. Um, a third characteristic that's very common to complex systems is this notion of heterogeneity. And what does that really mean? Um, and so as epidemiologists, you know, we might uh, think a, lo a lot about sort of um, risk factors, okay? Um, but in a complex system, it's not just the risk factors that are important. There's also a great deal of diversity um, in the actors that are um, uh, working on different parts of the system. And then there's also a great deal of diversity um, in the sectors, the organizational institutions and clusters um, that sit in different parts of the system. And all of that diversity across the actors, the factors, and sectors um, actually matter. So I think there's a common mis misperception that when people talk about taking a systems approach, immediately people are thinking, okay, 
um, we need to have more policies. You know, we need to have more regulations. Um, that's actually not uh, 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 systems thinking at all. It may be true that we need more regulations and policies, um, but that alone doesn't constitute um, the application of systems of perspective. So uh, you could have, um, like, as I said, um, a systems approach to addressing some uh, particular problem even at the cellular level. And then at, so at the individual level, um, with a systems thinking hat on, I would say, well, maybe what we need is not more education or skills. You know, the health behavior people have sort of established that. Um, but what we need to think about is how we actually engage those individuals um, at the individual level completely differently. So for instance, if we say that um, we need more public health policies, we need environmental change, well, how do we actually intervene at the individual level in order to make those environmental and policy changes possible? And that when those changes actually occur, that people respond most favor favorably. So, at the, so I'm still working at the individual level, but I'm asking a whole different set of questions um, that uh, many of which uh, can be researched and needs to be researched. So with a system, system thinking hat on, um, I think the uh, beauty is that it compels us, it opens up new doors uh, for us to think about uh, a whole different set of questions um, that perhaps a strictly reductionist approach um, hasn't allow, allowed us to entertain. Also part of complex systems um, is this notion of uh, uh, networks and um, uh, that, that are dynamically um, interactive. So you can have networks of, you know, again, brain cells. You can have networks of people. You can networks of, um, have networks of organizations. So these networks um, and, and, and the interaction that occur within these networks, um, as it turn out, really make a difference uh, in terms of the development, say, of a disease but also in terms of the potential impact of an intervention or a series of interventions. Um, and uh, um, as part of this notion of, of, of networks, um, uh, there are a couple of other more um, specific things I wanted to point out. Um, one is this notion of a collaboration versus competition. Um, and so from the business world, the business literature, there's actually quite a bit of work, uh, quite a bit of science um, uh, 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 documented um, in, uh, around uh, um, the impact of competition versus collaboration and, uh, and, and how one might actually foster either or both. So, so this is actually very relevant uh, to, uh, I think, the development of new public health interventions because we rarely um, incorporate uh, these uh, systems insights um, into how we actually approach um, public health work. So as it turned out, if you actually create competition and collaboration, but at the same level, on the same scale, okay, it doesn't really work because it leads to conflict. But if you try to create competition and, collaborate and co cooperation on sort of two different scales, then you can actually create this reinforcing uh, loop, um, this uh, virtuous cycle. So cooperation between players you know, within a team leads to, um, uh, uh, causes teams to compete, okay? And that competition uh, between teams then forces more cooperation between players within uh, a team. And so, uh, you know, at lunch I was talking to um, Dr. Giles Corday um, a little bit about sort of how do we overcome the problem of, you know, government departments um, being structured in a way that uh, makes it really difficult um, to innovate and make it really difficult to, you know, push kind of these systems approaches through. You know, so I, I sort of hypothesize that, that, well, what if, you know, within the context of the same resources that we have, so we're not asking for more money, um, what if we actually took people from different departments and created teams? So teams of uh, representatives from across departments 
You know, so you're fostering cooperation within those teams, but then you're making the, um, the different teams uh, across departments compete um, for particular incentive vis-a-vis um, -vis, you know, a particular um, health goal or a policy goal. Um, so you might have the, op the opportunity in that case um, to both foster cooperation between players within the teams, um, which are drawn, who are drawn from different departments, but then at the same time creating competition across those teams to spur innovation. And the team that comes up with the best idea, what performs the best, you know, then gets the money to actually do whatever the um, policy and programmatic uh, uh, um, initiative um, might entail. So it's an interesting way of, I think, uh, thinking, thinking about how we can potentially incorporate um, these concepts um, into uh, the um, pathways um, for innovation. Uh, the same is true at the individual level. So I don't know about here in Sydney, but like in New York, you know, you see, you go to like commercial gyms and um, in those gyms they have like, you know, dashboards. Uh, um, showing how fast you're pedaling in a spinning class. And, um, and as it turns out, you know, that dashboard um, is a huge motivator for people to you know, work extra hard uh, during a spinning session. Um, and so there are all sorts of ways where I think uh, the clever use of both cooperation and competition can really um, enhance um, the impact um, of the public health interventions that we put in place. Another really important aspect of complex systems is that um, they, they adapt over time. Um, they evolve, they learn. Um, and we know this, actually, um, from even very basic clinical, you know, physiological work, right? So this is Kevin Hull's work showing the dynamics of weight loss. Um, and uh, um, so our assumption about sort of a linear, you know, uh, equation between uh, calorie gain or calorie deficit um, in weight turn out to be not so true. Um, and uh, because the body um, uh, adapts to the new environmental circumstances, um, the relationship between your fat mass and fat-free mass adjusts um, as a result of, say, you know, uh, going on a diet, so having some kind of um, caloric deficit. And, um, so in this particular case, uh, the, uh, on average, um, you know, the body sort of achieves a, um, um, half of uh, uh, what you uh, could be predicted to lose um, in terms of weight at the end of one year, um, and then 95% um, by the end of the third year, um, and then it kind of plateaus out. So this both underscores the challenge of um, creating weight loss, but also shows that the body in itself is a complex system, um, and, uh, and this adaptation is something that we often fail to uh, account for um, in the way we approach um, complex problems, uh, not just obesity, but many other things. Also very important is the concept of delay. This is something that uh, is very, very difficult, um, highly intractable um, in public health practice, um, certainly uh, in uh, policy. Um, and so here I show you just a couple of examples. Um, the first one on, the, on, on your left uh, is the, this idea of uh, you turn on the, you know, um, the, the faucet and you're expecting hot water, but there's usually a couple of seconds delay before the water really warms up, right? So that's a very, very uh, sort of, um, uh, low-level um, kind of engineering example um, of what delay means. In a social system, we also have delays, right? And uh, sometimes those delays can be caused by leakages or inefficiencies. So you might have a school policy at a federal level, you know, that then trickles down to the state level, um, district, school, and all the way to the classroom. But with each transition, there are leakages. Um, to the potency um, of, that, uh, of, of, of that set of policy, whether it's because of implementation issues, whether it's because of negative response from the uh, you know, end user or you know, the recipient of the policy um, in each box, um, all sorts of reasons. 
But again, understanding where those leakages are and how we might be able to mitigate those leakages is actually a really important research endeavor that we're currently not really doing. Um, this obviously has implication for how we put interventions into place, right? So in a typical kind of NIH type research study, you put in an intervention without actually accounting for these things. And, um, and so your results become very uh, much ungeneralizable um, to the real life context. Um, so these uh, 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 delays um, are absolutely critical um, in uh, uh, the translation um, of science to uh, policy and practice. Last but not least, um, one of the things that system science um, is being used uh, uh, for is to anticipate not only the intended consequences of interventions, but also the unintended ones. Um, by hopefully uh, taking better stock of all the feedbacks, interdependence, adaptation, the heterogeneity, all the things that I've talked about um, uh, up to now, hopefully we, we have a better chance of detecting what the, some of these unintended consequences might be. So here I just give you one um, example. This is um, OECD um, data for, for the U.S. Um, in terms of fat and sugar intake. Um, so you can see that during the 80s and 90s, um, there was a big call um, to reduce fat consumption. Um, but at the same time, sugar intake actually went up. Now, that we don't have a way to actually ascertain causality here, but we do know from uh, uh, looking at secular trends um, as well as um, uh, 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 qualitative explorations of what's happening contextually that the industry did indeed begin to uh, use sugar to substitute um, for fat um, in a lot of uh, processed foods uh, during that time in order to maintain the palatability and the texture, consistency, so on and so forth, um, of uh, packaged goods. Um, so here's, you know, I mean, and there are a lot of many, there are many other examples um, in public health now where, you know, stories are changing um, as a result of new science, um, but also as some of these uh, unintended consequences begin to surface, um, you know, uh, in a delayed manner, albeit, um, but as they come, 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 come around, uh, public health then has to uh, fine tune or revisit um, some of its uh, uh, messages and approaches. Um, saturated fat being the latest, one of the latest uh, uh, targets, you know, where now there's renewed debate um, as to what that really means. So you can imagine that on the consumer side, how confusing and over overwhelming um, all of this must be. So what can we do given um, these uh, dimensions, characteristics um, of complex systems. Um, what we really want to do is to intervene um, on these systems dimensions uh, uh, explicitly and uh, in, 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 in many instances uh, simultaneously. Um, and so, uh, so, so that is what we mean um, by taking a systems approach to public health and that is what we mean by um, moving beyond the traditional multi-level or socio-ecological framework. So in thinking about how to design systems change strategies, um, I like uh, Diane Feingood's work um, around sort of thinking about uh, uh, intervention levels um, in the system um, from sort of the element, elemental level all the way to paradigm shifts. And a lot of what we do in public health um, is really focused on the elements. Um, and uh, so if you just take a strict, strict uh, sociological you know, kind of approach, then you may be intervening uh, at the individual level. You may be intervening at the policy level. But then you're not necessarily capturing the interconnections across those two. So let me give you some examples for each of these uh, uh, intervention levels. Um, so I already alluded to this. Um, information symmetry, I think, is actually one of the biggest problems. Um, and uh, you know, public health uh, historically has not done a very good job in uh, its communication to the public. And the public is rightfully confused uh, about where, uh, you know, uh, what, what exactly is um, the most appropriate course of action. Um, fortunately, um, with the advent of uh, uh, mobile technology, um, 
there's a, a tremendous opportunity um, to actually realign um, the symmetry of information um, for all the different actors um, and stakeholders. Uh, and so Pushcard actually is, uh, is a new app uh, being developed by a group at Cornell. Um, and what it does is it takes the information that grocer, grocers are collecting from food buyers um, and give that information back to the users in some meaningful, usable way. Um, so in the U.S., like New York, for example, it's very popular for people to actually order groceries from uh, online uh, merchants. And, uh, and they deliver the groceries you know, to, your, to your house. And, um, and information is obviously being collected um, auto automatically in terms of what you're purchasing. And so that information, which is already being harvested, harvested um, up to now is not really being used in any meaningful way for the consumers. It may be used by the businesses, but it's not being used by the consumers. So the idea of Pushcart is to give that information back to the consumers um, and uh, uh, while juxtaposing that information against uh, some health-based metrics, such as how many servings of fruits and vegetables um, you know, you're, uh, you're actually getting um, per week. And, um, and based on that information, the idea is then consumer would then um, be in a better position of adjusting um, what, it what, what he or she purchases in the next time. So this, that's the idea of information symmetry. There are a lot of other examples. Um, working with uh, uh, some colleagues um, in Harvard um, who are uh, using um, activity uh, patterns from sort of daily, daily transport, if you will, um, and connecting that to uh, uh, um, uh, GPS and you know, GIS information um, and based on the pattern of activity, uh, design tailored interventions to help the individual uh, to adjust um, his or her uh, subsequent uh, physical activity, um, such as you know, taking a different route to school, uh, for instance. Um, and so again, uh, I think with technology, um, the ability for public health to manipulate uh, the symmetry information um, in this space uh, is greatly enhanced. Now, feedbacks sometimes, intervening on feedback sometimes actually lead to structural changes, um, which uh, is really uh, uh, powerful um, and uh, uh, very, very exciting. Um, so this is a project I've been working on uh, for over the last uh, four or five years um, with the Access to Nutrition Foundation. And the idea here um, was to develop a leading um, index to uh, rate and rank um, all of the world's biggest food and beverage companies' contribution uh, to nutrition, both overall nutrition as well as uh, overnutrition and undernutrition. And so what this tool actually is doing is um, two things. First, it's actually creating a whole new competitive playing field um, because companies are uh, naturally competitive, um, they jostle uh, uh, each other to try to you know score better in the next round, and um, and, and so as a as a tool, uh, a benchmarking tool, um, it's serving um, both that accountability uh, function um, to hold companies to account in terms of what they're actually doing in the nutrition space, um, but it's also spurring innovation as companies try to um, improve their performance um, on such an index. The other thing that the tool is actually do, um, doing is that it is influencing the uh, financial investment sector. So increasingly, um, people are socially conscious investors are interested in doing value investing. So they like to know that the companies that they're investing in are actually contributing to some social good. Um, and so the more common indices are related to uh, corporate social responsibility, environmental sustainability, so on and so forth. Um, and so this is a new index that can be added um, to that mix. So a significant um, a a outreach activity uh, being done by the Access Nutrition Foundation is actually talking to the investment community to influence their practice in advising um, their uh, investors within their portfolios. So I think it's actually, uh, so although the initial concept 
is more about intervening on a partic particular um, information feedback loop um, uh, to both the companies as well as to the to the to the to the public. Um, over time, this has a potential to actually shift um, the entire structure um, of how of of of. Uh, finance um, and uh, food industry uh, in this particular case. Um, so some of the uh, structural changes um, can also relate to um, the social information um, and environmental architecture. Um, so this is actually drawn from the McKinsey, uh, the latest McKinsey uh, uh, report um, on obesity, um, which found that uh, there are uh, a number of influential mechanisms relating to sort of the subconscious aspect of behavioral change um, that are uh, tremendously underemployed um, uh, in public health. Um, and so people, I think, are familiar with the term cho choice architecture. Um, sometimes it's called nudging. Um, but I sort of want to highlight kind of the idea of, um, on social norms. So although it seems so uh, evident and, uh, you know, um, it's sort of a no-brainer. Um, the reality is, you know, we haven't actually gotten uh, a very good handle <laughs> on what exactly um, are the dynamics of normative changes in our populations. Rarely, for instance, um, do uh, public health surveillance systems measure social norms. You know, we measure BMI maybe, um, but we have no idea about uh, uh, changes in perception, p changes in people's uh, uh, support uh, for the different kinds of policies that we're advocating for. Um, and uh, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, space um, uh, in, in, in that area, both in terms of uh, surveillance, interventions, um, and uh, novel ways of uh, engaging uh, the public. Um, tipping, tipping phenomena. So tipping is also a, a characteristic of complex systems. And the idea there is that a small change in one part of the system somehow leads to a really unexpectedly large uh, change in the overall pattern, behavioral pattern of that system. So one example in public health that's often cited um, is the, the, the example of the tobacco surtax, right? So it's one lever that was pulled. Um, but that lever, when pulled, led to a really large a cascading effect um, on the overall smoking prevalence in the population. But there are also other ways of thinking about how tipping could potentially be incorporated um, into public health interventions, uh, specifically around structural change. So uh, one of the, this is actually just a, an article that I happened uh, to come across in an online magazine called The Edge. Um, and this uh, article is actually talking about um, uh, sort of uh, messaging, social marketing, and, um, and, and communications. And so uh, what is this? It's the tipping point offers the three rules of epidemics, the law of the few, the stickiness factor, and the power of context. So think a little bit about that. That's actually, it, it seems obvious, but actually as you think a little bit more about it, um, it's quite deep. Um, so the article goes on to talk about um, different kinds of messengers. You can have the connector, uh, which are uh, people who, who, uh, who seem to know everyone and have their feet in many circles. And you have the mavens, um, who are the vaults of information and want to advise others. And then you have the salesmen, who are the persuaders um, when others are unconvinced. So, Thinking about um, from a social marketing health communication standpoint in public health, um, how do we leverage the notion of connectors versus mavens versus salesmen in order to create um, and, and, and maximize um, our potential uh, reach um, and impact? Uh, I think that there's uh, um, uh, a lot of research <laughs> that needs to be done um, because I'm not sure that we really have a uh, good handle on that question in the public health space, certainly not in the obesity space. So um, earlier today, I, I, I briefly mentioned some of the work that I'm doing um, in terms of uh, integrating um, primary and secondary child obesity prevention um, in the uh, 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 community um, 
contexts um, within the U.S. And so we uh, recently developed, uh, established a new organization called Prevention Together that brings together um, the two sort of world's best scaled up um, primary uh, and secondary childhood, uh, childhood obesity prevention platforms. Um, the primary one is called EPO, the secondary prevention one is called MEND, which uh, I learned is very active in New South Wales. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's a version of EPO called OPAL um, in South Australia, so both actually exist um, in Australia already. Um, but in the U.S., what we're trying to do isn't, isn't just actually adding these two up. Um, what we really want to do is to create an infrastructure that serves as a connective tissue um, and, 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 and bring about collective impact um, within communities. So it's fundamentally about a different way of engaging uh, communities, um, realigning the activities um, so that they are actually reinforcing uh, in service of a shared agenda, uh, but also connecting the local to the national and the global, leveraging the infrastructure that's in place already nationally um, and making sure that that infrastructure actually touches individuals at the community level um, most effectively. So it's really about transforming um, uh, or being part of a transformation um, of the uh, public health infrastructure. Uh, and um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation you know, has been talking a lot about the creation of a, of a, a culture of health. Um, and part of that uh, work towards a cult culture of health um, is to rethink um, how we actually establish the uh, national infrastructure in order to create that movement uh, towards the culture of health. So we feel that uh, this is actually very much in line um, with, that, uh, with that effort. So just looking at time here, okay. Um, so we talked about feedbacks, we talked about structure. Um, now, what about goals? So earlier I talked about, you know, or, or, or asked, you know, are we actually asking the right questions? And I would argue that oftentimes we're not asking all the right questions. It doesn't mean that what we're doing is not important. It just means that we haven't actually um, asked some really important questions that also need to be brought into the fray. So um, in uh, one of our recent articles uh, as part of the uh, uh, second Lancet obesity series, um, we uh, uh, published a, an article put, uh, focused specifically on creating public demand. So, you know, at the beginning of my talk, you know, I said, you know, how do you apply systems thinking at the individual level, right? Systems thinking doesn't mean that we shouldn't be dealing with individuals at all, but it may mean that we need to actually do different things than what we have been doing at the individual level. So, um, in this particular paper, we're interested, you know, how you actually mobilize the public to uh, effect policy change. And so we looked at, um, uh, literature in political science, sociology, and uh, in other fields, um, and uh, learn that um, there are some uh, really uh, common, key common uh, uh, strategies um, uh, uh, as part of an effective uh, policy process. Um, message unison. So I talked a little bit about information symmetry and the streamlining of information. You know that's very very important. We talked about. Um, Organized uh, advocacy and lobbying, citizen engagement and protests, you know, how you actually foster that, um, you know, from a public health standpoint. And we talked about the creation of a favorable political environment. Um, so um, I don't have time to go into all of those details. You can easily pull up the paper um, and uh, at your leisure. But in the, 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 the sum of it is that we need to look at both the supply of the healthy products, healthy places, healthy policies, which is what public health typically does, um, but also look at the demand um, in, in meeting that supply, which is where the paper um, is trying to argue. Um, so another way of looking at it um, is through this uh, political science framework uh, by Kingdon um, that talks about kind of the multiple streams, right? So in public health, we're very good at the problem stream. We're getting better um, at the policy stream, but we're very, very poor at the politics stream. And earlier today, in the afternoon, there was uh, quite a bit of discussion in our forum amongst the uh, center investigators um, around uh, uh, really needing to better understand the dynamics of politics and how 
policies are actually made, um, you know, enacted and responded to. And, uh, and, and that's a whole um, uh, research arena um, that's not really part of the mainstream uh, public health work at the moment. Um, healthy cities movement, one of the things, so this is uh, uh, kind of a, it's, it's global, um, but this example is particularly drawn from, um, from Europe. And um, one of the things, uh, key lessons um, from the evaluation of the healthy cities movement in Europe um, was the importance in investing in and cultivating um, social entrepreneurs. So these agents of change within communities um, and, and uh, upscaling their capacity um, to, uh, to, to become leaders um, in the uh, transformation um, of communities. Um, and so again, it goes back to that tipping phenomenon that I talked about earlier. And this context is not so much about social marketing, but it's about leadership. And um, uh, and, uh, and and so I, I thought it was really interesting that way back when, uh, you know, that uh, these lessons were already emerging. We just didn't really understand how to place these lessons um, in a uh, systems framework. But now it's all kind of coming together. Um, Another example uh, here from Slovenia, um, this is kind of a, um, a good example of a, uh, a, of a sort of what's known as a punctuated uh, equilibrium, uh, which is another political science framework um, that's very informative um, for uh, thinking about the policy process. So in the case of Slovenia, um, uh, at the uh, uh, sort of at the outset of its entry um, into the European Union, um, some really, really smart and insightful people in Slo 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 Slovenia saw that as a great opportunity um, to develop some coherent um, health uh, strategies, um, and one focused specifically on food and nutrition. And so, um, uh, these people, um, many of whom uh, you know work in the government, but also included folks that were outside the government, um, sought to actually develop an infrastructure um, that would capitalize on Slovenia's um, impending entry in the EU um, to actually make this happen. And so, um, here is a, a table that kind of summarizes. Uh, the roles and the functions um, that were incorporated um, into this infrastructure, you know, from the more traditional kind of analytical, you know, data-based uh, 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 aspect, all the way to the strategic and very importantly, what they call the policy entrepreneurial role, um, in order to take advantage of political change. Um, and very importantly, to think beyond the nutrition issue. So although the goal was to develop a food and nutrition strategy, the process by which this group of people actually took um, to get this uh, to happen um, was to build alliances um, with a lot of other uh, fields, including uh, folks in the environmental sector. And, um, and, and, and all of this was uh, a, a very um, uh, intensive process of building that foundation. Um, so the minute the EU accession actually happened, they were able to then, uh, uh, you know, argue for, for and uh, put in place um, this uh, particular strategy um, as Slovenia became this sort of common market. Um, and so that's a really good example from the public health world in terms of how punctuated equilibrium was actually applied um, to create policy change. Um, a third uh, a framework that many of you will be familiar with is sort of the, uh, the framework called Advocacy Coalition. Um, and the best example that I've been able to find um, in the obesity space is actually a Mexican example. Uh, many of you know that in spite of a conservative government, Mexico actually successfully passed a uh, uh, soda and uh, junk food uh, tax um, uh, a little bit more than a year ago. And, um, and to a great extent, they were able to do that in spite of a conservative government was because of the amazing uh, coalition building, the incredible infrastructure and organization um, that they uh, put in place um, to, uh, to, to create this unified voice um, across different sectors. 
uh, and um, and very cleverly um, used. Uh, you know, politicians, uh, celebrities, um, you know, uh, really clever social marketing campaigns. Um, they, you know, they did one, for example, on what they call the uh, junk food cartel, uh, and obviously capitalizing on the contemporary conscious consciousness around the drug problem in the Mexican context specifically. Um, but they developed, uh, they used uh, characters, um, children's characters from different uh, 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 processed foods, um, you know, to create a story um, around what they call the junk food cartel, and that was very, very effective because everybody, um, you know, in in the in public, you know, could uh, relate um, to what that uh, metaphor, that analogy, um, was signifying. And so, um, anyway, so I I think that again, you know, in the U.S. at least, we're quite poor um, at organizing our coalitions. We have many, many coalitions. Um, I think actually uh, Paul Kelly, who you know was presented on uh, policy, OBC uh, policies in, in New York City, you know, one of the findings in his report um, was that people didn't necessarily believe in having kind of a centralized um, infrastructure um, and. Uh, uh, the the trend seems to be working more in small clusters of coalitions, um, and but the problem with that is oftentimes there's duplication um, across these clusters of coalitions, and even more importantly, oftentimes there are significant uh, work areas or strategies that are being missed because in th the effort hasn't really been undertaken to really understand how the different clusters of small coalitions cohere around a common shared agenda. And so that's a big problem we're facing in the US. You know, we, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a symptom of our success in some ways. Um, we have invested a lot um, in community prevention, um, but right now they're just you know baskets of sometimes uh, quite random things, um, and there isn't a common framework um, to really make sure that what's happening within our community uh, is always a reinforcing um, of each other. Okay, so um, um, so when we look at um, goal changes, that then also then trickles down. So earlier in the day, you know, um, uh, another Paul talked about sort of you know transcendentalism. Uh, you know, and, and one of the challenges, you know, in systems work is, you know, we have a tendency to look only from the top down um, and not from the bottom up. Uh, and, but in a true systems framework, we actually really should be doing both. Um, and so if our goal is to mobilize the public for policy action, um, at the elemental level, it means that we actually fundamentally need to be doing very different things, right? And so, uh, you know, I just give you some some examples here in the paper. We, you know, uh, cite a lot more examples. Um, but uh, say in education, you know, instead of nutrition education, you know, uh, what we really should be investing in maybe should be civic engagement as a value. Uh, we talk about um, you know public health training, academic and public health workforce. Um, but maybe what we really should be doing is how to train, not only train them, but we actually train change agents and placing them um, across different sectors. So not only training people who will then take up jobs in academia or public health agencies, but training um, public health-minded individuals who can then beca beca uh, become uh, leaders of change, um, say, in the food sector or in the entertainment world, um, other industries. So. I think that when we start to shift our goal or to entertain the possibility of having different goals, um, that then um, uh, that compels us to then think about uh, what we do um, at the more elemental level. I also talked a little bit about uh, my work with designers and architects, um, and uh, uh, which has taught me tremendously um, in terms of how to uh, think creatively and innovatively, um, adapting some of the methods that they use um, in approaching uh, product or service design um, or architectural design in this case. Um, so uh, there is actually a website that I didn't mention this morning um, called uh, WeMoveSchoolsForward.com, which houses a lot of the uh, information, materials um, that we have developed over the years. Um, and uh, there's a video about a prototype school um, in Buckingham County, Virginia. 
that uh, you're welcome to uh, take a look at. Um, I think it's quite, uh, uh, it's a well done movie and kind of ca encapsulates uh, not only the, the thinking, but actually the emotion um, in, in this work as well. Um, but one of the things about uh, doing this work um, in Buckingham uh, with the prototype school was to think not only about health, um, but even more importantly to think about environmental sustainability and learning because the school district got money to actually renovate this school, not because it was thinking about health. It wanted to lead school. It wanted a school that actually uh, you know, would be designated as a green building. Um, and then, of course, the teachers are most concerned about learning outcomes and not so much about health. Um, and so we were able to fortunately convince them that they could really get two birds with one stone um, and that this wasn't going to cost them anything more. Uh, it just required a little bit more creative thinking how we can actually leverage all these co-benefits um, uh, at once. And so I, so I thought the, um, you know, the design is really, really, uh, uh, really a very insightful process and uh, you know led to a lot of elements that touch on all these three things um, you know within the same space um, another example is uh, the work that um, I um, had been doing um, in my previous position in Omaha Nebraska um, and uh, with, the, with the Latino community there um, so we got some funding to uh, think about how we can incorporate uh, youth activism and youth advocacy um, in our obesity work. And I put in a proposal, um, but in the proposal to the Robert Johnson Foundation that got funded, um, but in the proposal we specifically said that we're actually not going to be looking at obesity outcomes, <laughs> um, even though it's an obesity related RFA. Um, but I said, you know, what we really want to do is to focus on community readiness because we recognize that in disadvantaged communities, most interventions don't work because they're um, not tailored to the level of readiness um, in these uh, specific communities. So we couldn't expect them to really work, um, even if it was already evidence-based. Um, and so this work um, really changed the way I think about uh, uh, you know, um, interventions actually. Think about community, you know, health, like what actually is really needed um, in these disadvantaged communities and, <coughs> and definitely is not some repackaged uh, evidence-based intervention, um, you know, from the, you know, preventive services guidelines um, that we have in the U.S. Um, there, there are all sorts of way more fundamental things um, that actually need to happen first um, before we can introduce um, uh, those interventions. So, um, so uh, it was a very humble experience for me um, to kind of undergo uh, that process of, uh, of rethinking, reinvention, um, and uh, a lot of what I thought, you know, had to be thrown out. And uh, um, and what we found was, you know, with the with the mixture um, of what what we had, um, uh, linking youth activism, cross-sectoral collaboration, um, and uh, focusing on really developing a social marketing and you know, school community-based uh, engagement initiatives, um, we were able to actually improve um, measured readiness um, over about uh, two years. And so uh, it's, it, this work uh, continues to evolve. and. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we're still at it, um, even though the um, grant has, uh, has run out. Um, so again, um, I use this to just illustrate that, you know, sometimes we're so focused on obesity or particular disease, but actually that may or may not be the right target, you know, at this moment in time. So finally, um, in the Diane Feingus uh, systems level intervention, you know, the highest level, the most difficult to change um, is really the paradigm shifts. Um, and these are shifts um, in our value systems, right? So I threw out kind of a piece of uh, food for thought, you know, earlier today about, you know, sort of economic, uh, you know, rationales um, for prevention uh, de based prevention related decisions. And I, you know, my comment was, you know, I think that that's very, very important. Um, but there has to be some other arguments, um, you know, from philosophy and uh, humanities and, you know, other ways of looking at our social values that need to be factored into this conversation. 
Um, and uh, you know, I don't know if it's possible, um, but it's certainly worthwhile to think about you know, whether uh, change can happen, not only as a function of uh, dollars, but as a function of you know, other aspects um, of our value system. So you know, some examples here, um, certainly very relevant in the US, um, is to try to move the discourse away from just healthcare to actually health. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of public health research, you know, moving from a more uh, uh, problem-centric paradigm, uh, you know, ever finer descriptions, you know, of the problem at hand, um, to a much more solution um, and action-oriented uh, paradigm. Um, and I think we often forget that, you know, for the public, sometimes it's not always about health. You know, a lot of times it's about love, it's about pleasure, it's about hope. Um, in a lot, in, in many of the disadvantaged communities that I worked in, um, it is hope that actually motivates people. The hope that their children will one day have a better life. Um, and so I think we need to learn uh, a lot more, listen a lot more, um, in order to tap into those uh, fundamental um, value-based, um, you know, motivations uh, that uh, uh, help people change. So, um, very quickly at the end, I realized that we're uh, running out of time very quickly. Um, so, I just want to kind of give you a sense, a glimpse of um, uh, some of the additional frameworks that typically sit outside of public health. Uh, space um, that could potentially be very informative um, for how we design interventions um, as well as how we measure uh, systems change. So um, one such uh, framework comes out of sort of the business and uh, social service kind of a nonprofit world um, that uh, is called collective impact and, uh, and, and there's a lot of, uh, there's increasing attention um, on how we use this uh, you know, for uh, public health uh, uh, goals. And so the idea here is really that, um, you know, a diverse group of actors commit to a, moving from the concept that a diverse group of actors commit to a common agenda to solve a complex problem, to really thinking about the outcome of social changes achieved through the synergy and not merely the sum of the efforts. Um, and uh, uh, there are five key ingredients to collective impact, um, and you can actually get a lot more details uh, freely um, online at collectiveimpactforum.org. Um, but these five uh, elements include having a shared common agenda, um, having, uh, I talked about a lot, the kind of mutually reinforcing activities, having that backbone organization, um, which is kind of what the Prevention Together is trying to be, um, and uh, having continuous communication in um, measurement uh, platforms. And uh, I, in terms of um, how one um, might you know, organize um, and plan uh, evaluation of systems change, um, these are some of the uh, big buckets um, of, uh, of uh, activities. Um, so you have phases and foci of evaluation. Um, you have the development of the outcomes and indicators. And that's actually important because collect, like, even with a collective impact model, it doesn't necessarily tell you what exactly those indicators are. And so there's actually a tremendous amount of research that needs to happen vis-a-vis you know, -vis a particular public health um, uh, situation. Uh, there needs to be a methods for data capture and communication, um, and then there needs to be uh, the ability to adapt um, and, uh, in doing micro-evaluation. Um, and so I was uh, uh, heartened to hear you know, from Andrew that, you know, that, that there is actually quite a bit of flexibility built into the center's um, work um, in that you are you know, able to adapt and, uh, uh, and evolve um, you know, as a function of the, the landscape um, you know, here in Australia. And I think that that is so key. Um, and the question then is how do we actually evaluate um, that evolution? Um, as part of the documentation of the center's uh, uh, work and success. So um, microevaluation, I think, is absolutely critical. And here I illustrated um, in the form of um, design thinking. So this is one of the things that I have really appreciate, uh, appreciated having worked with uh, my designer and architect friends um, who kind of pointed me um, in a new direction of actually just how I go about business um, in my academic and public health work. 
And, um, and the idea here is rather than thinking linearly, you know, what we need to be doing in terms of developing and evaluating intervention actually, has to, it actually should be it iterative. And the most important part is this notion of uh, rapid prototyping and testing. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and as you do these sort of micro-evaluations with your prototypes, um, the results then inform the redesign um, of your ultimate product. And so, uh, and designers, this is what they do. They go through this kind of iterative process on a, on a, a you know, continuous basis um, until they get to that sort of final product that, you know, could be commercialized. Um, and so I, I'm very intrigued um, by the notion of uh, applying this, adapting this, and applying it um, to community health. You know, could it be a way for us to systematize, for example, CBPR, community-based participatory research? Could it be a way for us to actually really uh, engage um, com uh, uh, people in um, disadvantaged communities in order to reduce or narrow um, the disparity gap. Um, I think that there's some really intriguing and, uh, and hy hypothesizable um, you know, questions uh, that, uh, that can be researched and tested. Um, so um, when you're evaluating systems change um, using for a, a, a collective impact framework, you're interested not only in terms of the outputs and you know, your final outcomes in terms of BMI, but you're actually very interested in evaluating the design and the implementation. You're also very interested in evaluating the context in which this change um, is occurring. And you're also very interested um, in intervening on and measuring um, the learning culture that may be facilitating or not um, the change process. So what I like about this you know, is that um, it really highlights, I think, some additional areas um, that we need to develop measures for, um, that we need to be tracking. Um, in order to gain a broader picture of how the, uh, the system is working, how the different parts are moving together. Um, so I already talked about this. And um, you know, the one thing that I would just mention is that you know, trust doesn't just happen <laughs> overnight. Nobody wants to invest. Uh, you know, no funder wants to invest in the cultivation of trust. Um, yet, it is so fundamental to working in collaborative teams, um, and it's going to be absolutely essential if we truly believe in taking a multi-sectoral approach um, to uh, complex problems like obesity. And so, I think I, you know, the center, I think, is well positioned uh, you know, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, a backbone organization uh, to potentially uh, play, a, play a role in cultivating that trust across sectors. So um, I'll skip through these. Um, so in conclusion, um, so we know that the, there are these intractable um, global burdens of disease, right? That's, that's well established. But knowing that, you know, it's not enough. Um, we also know that um, increasingly, or it's being recognized, that there needs to be a multi-pronged solution. This, again, is from the McKinsey report. Um, the idea is that we actually just need to throw all of these things you know, into the batch, um, and that'll give us uh, the biggest uh, bang, you know, uh, biggest impact. And so they did some modeling and show that if you actually just um, did 60 percent of the interventions identified, that could actually um, bring 20 percent uh, of overweight and obese individuals into a normal weight category. Fantastic. Um, but the reality is that that is actually not quite enough. I would argue that by simply just throwing the, those different strategies, you know, some at the individual level, some at the environmental policy level into the mix, that actually isn't um, necessarily the smartest thing to do. Um, you know, it, it's true that we need multi-pronged strat strategies, but again, those multi-pronged strategies need to be interconnected. They need to be coherent, um, and we need to understand what that coherence actually really means. So back to the forests and the trees. This is again from, uh, this is actually the leading, the, the first article in the Lancet Obesity Series, uh, which talked about the false dichotomies that are um, undermining um, our 
uh, ability to move um, in a system's uh, direction. And I will argue that, again, the forest versus the trees, that's another false dichotomy. So for those of you in the center who might be tentative um, about uh, you know, uh, in, uh, um, uh, uh, progressing um, in this sort of system's direction, um, Fear not, <laughs> because I, I can guarantee you that what you're doing, um, you know, has uh, 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 has meaning and is connected to a larger system. You know, I said earlier that, you know, silo. I, I'm okay with silos um, because um, even with a system's perspective, um, you need boundaries. Boundaries are actually essential um, to uh, any system's work. What is not good is isolation. So if you're working in a very discrete project and you, you're working in somewhat of a silo, um, that isn't necessarily bad um, in and of itself. Um, what will be bad is if we can't figure out a way how your particular silo is connected to other silos and how all the silos um, are connected you know, to a common shared agenda. And so I think that's really uh, a very important task um, that uh, uh, you know, folks can actually uh, uh, take together, cohere around um, to figure out, you know, what that um, uh, uh, systems map, you know, might look like um, for the center um, in its goals. So uh, just very quickly, um, individuals matter, not only as passive recipients of information, but really active agents that can um, be uh, engaged to create change and capacity to create change. Capacity building, building trust, absolutely critical, and we shouldn't actually poo-poo it and think, oh, that's not really science. Um, it's fundamental to everything that we're talking about. Um, the idea of uh, creating um, uh, distributed actions, um, clear accountability as a way to structure the system, um, I think that's also very important. And you can really um, leverage the network of actors um, in this kind of dis cleverly designed and accountable uh, distributed system in order to uh, uh, create greater impact. The clever use of cooperation in competi competition across different scales within our social system, again, I think is much under underutilized, yet we know from the management sciences that it's very, very effective in creating organizational change. Um, and then finally, uh, understanding failures is just as important um, as understanding successes, and that should be uh, very much part of our um, ongoing evaluation platform. So I, I think I'll stop there.